Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Church of the Epiphany. I'm Father Aaron, and today is Sunday, January the 31st. It is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes, who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this week is Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, whoever, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possesses knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, 
those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching, with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Folks, as I have shared before, the season after the Epiphany, this season here at the beginning of a new year, brings us stories of how Jesus is being revealed to the world. These are the origin stories of the gospel and how it all began. So as Jesus begins his ministry and recruits a few disciples, the first stop he makes, and we shouldn't be surprised, was at a local synagogue. The Sabbath has come, the people of Capernaum have gathered, prayers are offered, the scriptures are read. And right away, again, as we might expect, the good rabbi starts to teach. Jesus opens the scriptures. He speaks with authority. He's there to share the good news of God's kingdom, the good news of God's love. But no sooner than the words are out of his mouth, Jesus gets his first challenge, the first of many throughout his ministry. A man in the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, we are told, immediately and loudly objects. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This unclean spirit recognizes Jesus for exactly who and what he is. This unclean spirit sees Jesus as a threat. But without missing a beat, Jesus rebukes this spirit, performs what would become his first exorcism. In other words, Jesus shows us who is boss. This story, folks, coming right at the beginning of Mark's gospel should be a vivid reminder for all of us. Right off the bat, Jesus makes it clear that something new is coming into the world. A powerful force is being unleashed. And that force is nothing less than God's truth. Now, the unvarnished truth is indeed a powerful thing. It can build up, but all too often the truth begins by tearing some things down. By shining the light of truth, false narratives are exposed. Injustice is revealed. Because when the unvarnished truth is spoken, it can and should upset a whole lot of apple carts, so to speak. Let me be perfectly clear. Jesus was a threat. He was a threat to the status quo, a threat to the powers that be. He was a threat to the way things have always been done, a threat to those who considered themselves the authorities. 
Jesus came to shake things up, to turn the world upside down, to open up the hearts and minds of the people, to speak the truth, God's truth, in a way that the people had never heard it before. Jesus was the physical sign of God's truth breaking into the world. And that truth was a threat. So let's take a moment, shall we, and consider the shape and size and scope of that threat. As we said, Jesus threatens to speak the truth and speak the truth to power. He threatens to hold people accountable for their actions and their inactions. He threatens to call out greed and avarice, hypocrisy, and injustice. He even dares to tell us what to do with our stuff. To a world and a people too often caught up in the accumulation of possessions, that is indeed a threat. But it doesn't stop there. The threats continue to pile up. Consider this. Jesus threatens to take up the cause of the poor, the hungry, the meek. Jesus threatens to heal our brokenness, even as we too often cling to that brokenness, because it's all we know. Jesus threatens to break down the barriers that separate us from God, threatens to liberate us from the power of sin and death. Jesus threatens even to go to the cross, to not only, not only call out the injustice of the world that would execute an innocent man, but also to show us what sacrificial love really looks like. Yes, Jesus threatens to love us into submission. Because at the end of the day, I believe God's love is ultimately irresistible and inescapable. Folks, this story, this passage of Scripture from Mark, these words of Jesus, they convict me. They confront me. They challenge me. It makes me wonder how Jesus is a threat to me. Yes, to me. How is Jesus shaking me up? How is Jesus turning my world upside down? Perhaps that's a question you might ask yourselves as well. If the last 11 months has revealed anything, it has certainly shown us that every one of us has had our world shaken and turned upside down. A global pandemic, economic turmoil, a contentious and divisive election, an attack on our capital. And these are only the macro signs, so to speak, that we can see on the news. Our individual lives have been shaken as well. We have been hit where we live, so to speak. There is the necessary estrangement from one another for the sake of one another's health, the inability to see our relatives and loved ones. How counterintuitive is that in a time of deep need? Perhaps you, along with me, feel the deep longing for a simple embrace, the simple joy of shaking a hand, hugging a neck, kissing a cheek. And of course, there is the loss of so many public gatherings, concerts, movies, parties, banquets, and dare I say it, worship and church. And many of us, of course, have had a tough time just doing our jobs, blessed to have jobs, but a tough time doing them. Reimagining my own professional vocational life continues to be a struggle and a work in progress one that is hard to measure. As of right now, I'm sitting here in my office, speaking into my phone, and hoping this message somehow finds its way to you. Like many of you, just a year ago, 
I could not have imagined that this is the world we would inhabit. But I will not call the challenges of this world a test from God. I refuse. I do not believe that that is how God works, hurling lightning bolts at us from heaven, creating obstacles to somehow teach us a lesson. No, folks, I believe God is God and viruses are viruses. Just like I believe God is God and cancer is cancer. God is God and natural disasters will happen. That is all a part of God's providence, not our own. Yes, the natural world exercises its own kind of freedom, just as we do. So I believe the question for us, the vital question for us, is less about what lesson are we learning, what are we being taught, and more how and where are we finding Christ in this present moment? How is Christ threatening to change us and change us for the better? Now, I will not pretend to know the answer to that question for you or even for me right now. All I can do is try as Jesus asks me, to open my eyes to see, to open my ears to hear. Yes, if I feel threatened, then that is an opportunity for a deeper dive, a chance to question my own motives, to examine my own fears, and perhaps even to discern what God might be calling me to be and to do. Yes, folks, I believe Jesus was and is a threat, a threat to our status quo, a threat to our preconceived notions, a threat to the world as it is. But I also believe that this threat is actually good news. Blessings and peace, everyone. Amen. The prayers of the people are formed too. Let us pray for our own needs and the needs of others. I ask your prayer for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops, Michael and Glenda, for our parish, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any kind of need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Lois and Roger. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for Barbara, Susan, Anne, William, Dick, Marina, Robert, Ellen, Catherine, Maggie, Doug, Ann, Liz, Jim, Vicki, Jenny, Ramona, Lance, Robbie, Barbara, Yair, Bobby, Cam, David, Darlene, Virginia, Mitch, Greg, Omar, George, Jack, 
Stephanie, and Dana. I ask your prayers for our seminarian, Sherry Harrison. I ask your thanksgiving for those celebrating birthdays this week, Becky, Bruce, Barbara. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.